three decades of experience in the asset management business. He's currently the managing director of Sundaram Alternates, driving growth across different platforms, geographies, and asset classes. During his career, he has had several influential and senior management positions across marquee financial service organizations. He also has a broad range of interest across functions like global, domestic sales, investment management, digital and physical distribution and marketing. He has worked in uh, several responsibilities in the organization like Brilla Sun Life International AMC Limited, ING Investments. He was the CEO of Edelweiss Asset Management Limited, successfully driving the business around. Among his industry affiliations, he has been an erstwhile member of the Mutual Fund Advisory Committee. He was also on the Board of Association of Mutual Funds in India, heading the ETF and Indexing Committee. He is the co-chair of the India Venture and Alternate Capital Association, Category 3 AIF Council. Vikash is an active fintech enthusiast and is currently on the Advisory Committee of India Fintech Forum. Vikash, uh, I know alternate investments is not a very easy concept to understand for investors who are just getting started. Uh, the audience that we have will have a mix of uh, investors with some just about getting started. Some would be a seasoned investor and some would have some understanding of alternative in the landscape. Uh, over to you, Vikash, to take us through uh, how you feel, you know, the alternate inv investments add value to investors portfolio and how the landscape is changing in India. Uh, at the outset, thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction and for this privilege to talk to your uh, esteemed clientele. Uh, while you were introducing me, you took me back uh, at the start of my career, virtually at the start of my career, uh, when we actually started talking about mutual funds. Mutual funds at that point of time were alternate investments. So in 30 years, it's become mainstream. Uh, and, you know, I always watch Standard Chartered Bank and the pedigree which Standard Chartered Bank has uh, manifest itself across various sections of uh, investment management. I don't know whether the audience knows about it, but the country's first debt only mutual fund was Standard Chartered. And one of the breakthrough things which Standard Chartered did, uh, Standard Chartered Mutual Fund did, and of course the bank helped, was to enable T plus zero redemptions. That means you could put in a redemption at nine o'clock and your account would be credited by 11 o'clock. I think it would have spurred on even more innovations in terms of this category if it were not for some regulatory, regulatory changes which happened. But uh, just to start off, thank you so much and uh, thank you everybody for your time. I'm going to be attempting to talk about alternates, alternates, alternatives, people use them in a fungible manner. But the fundamental thing is that things are changing. Things are changing. There is a permanent state of change. I'll just uh, put on my presentation uh, so that we can all have a look. Do let me know, you know, if uh, you're able to see it. So while Vikash uh, uploads the presentation, uh, just a housekeeping announcement. Uh, uh, during the session, if you have any questions, you can put it on the chat box. Uh, the Q&A tab is on the right-hand side, and we will gradually pick it up either during the presentation or after. So this is pretty much what I'm going to talk about in the next 20, 25 minutes. Uh, you know, I have uh, preempted certain questions which uh, people normally ask, uh, but just let me quickly take you through a few slides to just set the context. To talk about alternates, we have to first talk about conventional. What is conventional? And the fun part is, that everything is changing, change is permanent. Uh, as Thomas Friedman said in his book, uh, uh, you know, thank you for being late. That's one of the best selling book of his. He said that there are three changing, three things changing simultaneously across the globe, change, rate of change and global warming. And that is evident, it is manifesting itself in every single section of life, primarily investments. So if you look at it, the change is going across macroeconomic environments, business cycles, product preferences, the behavior you and I are exhibiting, all of this is changing very, very rapidly. So there's a permanent state of change. Uh, has it happened now? Actually, it's been happening for quite some time. If you look at permanent changes in global hierarchy, UK, incidentally, was the world's largest stock market until World War I, before it got dethroned by NYSE. Uh, then you had Germany and the US. After the war, Germany and the US led global trade for a century or more than a century. China took over it from uh, took over from US in 1990. Today, Germany and US contribute half of what China contributes now. 50 years ago, if you would have told somebody about this, they would have laughed at you. 10 years ago, China was the chosen one. Everybody and anybody was making a beeline to China. In the last four years, there's a clear migration happening from the chosen one to China plus one. The countries like ours are benefiting. Why go to uh, companies? Let's look at uh, countries. Let's look at companies. 
you know, if you would have stayed invested in GE, for example, throughout its journey, GE is one of the longest surviving corporates in the world today, you would have made a lot of money, okay? Uh, in the 1990s, it was at $93 billion. It has gone up to $152 billion, but from the number one position, it is now at 87th position. So if you would not have adapted to change, uh, you would have made much lesser money than otherwise what you would have expected. Let's talk about PERMA change in terms of investment themes. Every 10 years, there is a new investment theme which comes in, which becomes the next shiny thing. Uh, you know, in the 1950s, it was European stocks. In the 1960s, it was the US top stocks. In the 1970s, there was an oil shock which happened. The price of oil skyrocketed from $3 to $32, almost 10 times. And you had its impact on gold and oil prices. In the 1980s, the China was ruling the roost. Uh, in fact, China just breached the peak it made in the 1980s. But China was the flavor of the season at that point of time. In 1990s, you saw Nasdaq going up. And that was on the back of the dot-com boom. In 2000s, everything changed. It became emerging markets and commodities, a complete 180 degree turn from technology. Technology made an extremely strong comeback, but in a more concentrated fashion in 2010. What's it going to be in 2020? Uh, I would wager it's going to be back again to emerging markets and commodities, but more on that later. Let's talk about events impacting market cycles. You know, uh, there are some events which impact dramatically. There are some impacts which don't. We would not know about them at the time the impact is happening. But ballpark, if you look at some of these events and they have changed world history, you will find that if the fall from the peak uh, during an event is more than 15%, it takes a disproportionate amount of time to come back to the peak. And it can range from anything like 126 days to 1,000 days in terms of the global financial crisis. Uh, that's something you cannot anticipate and you have to be prepared for. The pace of recovery post a global event is in state of flux. You know, traditionally, you will find uh, people like me and Ravi uh, talk about the correlation or the, uh, the, the cyclical relationship between equity and bonds. We've been born and brought up on the fact that, you know, there is a negative correlation. Equities and bonds move in separate directions. But what has happened is data has shown that in the times of a crisis, it actually converges. There is no negative correlation which is seen for periods of time. Does that mean that, uh, you know, you just jettison whatever you're doing? Actually, the answer is that diversification through absolute return strategies become the need of the hour, which is something which I'll talk about as we go ahead. Let's talk about PERMA change in terms of volatility, which is happening globally. If you would have been stuck to one geography, you would have made decent money, but you would have had seen, seen some very, very high volatility happening. Uh, you can already see between the three countries, USA, UK, and China, represented by their indices, uh, how much of volatility has happened uh, over the years. Uh, the USA was the number one country at one point of time in terms of returns, and it just seesawed. And you can see China, uh, how, how the returns have panned out. It's very difficult to bet on a single geography. You cannot have a strategy which says, I will invest only in one country. Vikash, since we are on the topic of volatility and returns. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in the previous slide, when you showed the correlation between equities and bonds, that hype, you know, at, there are points where it can change. It can become uh, very positive from actually being negative. Can you take an example of the recent uh, few years when uh, it was actually very sharp, uh, sharply uh, uh, positive and it impacted both the asset classes? Did, could we quote an example over the recent past? Actually, if you look at the U.S. banking crisis, which happened uh, very recently, uh, let's talk about the global financial crisis, for example, which happened. What this slide essentially says is when there is time of stress, when there is a sell-off, uh, money just gets out. Money will move to probably a safe haven like uh, gold. Money will just get sold off. So a bond trader or a bond uh, firm would tend to relinquish their positions, anticipating a rise in interest rate, tightening of liquidity, and it would have its ramifications in equity thereafter. For that period, brief period of time, it could be a period of six months, it could be a period of a year, it could be a period of one and a half year. They do not move uh, with a negative correlation. They move together. So when there's a sell-off, it moves together. And that is exactly what this slide is talk, trying to talk about. So when you are making a strategy for, of your own, when you are investing, uh, there has to be a strategy which will give you absolute returns. Typically, absolute returns are those uh, which, give you, which tend to give you a very sort of stoic return chart. You know, a positive return chart 
over a period of time, it may not be as high as what the conventional returns would be in a bull market, but the drawdowns would be far sharper than what you see in a bear market. And it contains of different asset classes as well as hedging. So this is what it's trying to show here. Uh, I talked to you about countries. Well, if you bet on a single country and you said I bet only on India and I'll pick up only blue chips, I'll pick up only the Nifty 50, you would have lost out on a lot of money if you just stick to one particular, lost out on an opportunity cost of a lot of money if you would have stuck to just one particular market cap. The cap curve itself has been, uh, you know, has been very, very volatile. For example, uh, you know, if you see uh, 2018, the only index which did well was Nifty 50. Everything else was down, okay? And then you would have said, okay, you know, two years in succession, 2018, 19, uh, the mid cap index or the small cap index has not done very well. Let me just put all my money there. You would have made some decent money, but then boom, 2020 happened and small cap went through the floor. So the idea is that this is a state of permanent change. You cannot get stuck to one particular, uh, you know, cap curve to make money. And that is probably the answer to some of the questions on the market outlook, which I will talk about. People are still talking about a lot of mid caps and small caps. And I'm just trying to zoom out and show here that too much of dependence on one thing is going to be difficult. Uh, this is something I think we have experienced. We are experiencing. Uh, most of us are global travelers and, uh, you know, we find it extremely difficult now to transact overseas because there's no UPI. Uh, you know, people still ask for cash, people still ask for credit cards. But if you see the transaction patterns of India, how they're changing, Checks and cash are virtually out, okay? And something like UPI, which is not even 10 years old, has now crossed all possible uh, means of transaction. Cash has been completely dethroned. Uh, and this is something which is manifesting itself across the board, from a 10 rupee transaction to a 10,000 rupee transfer, you know, to RTGS, it's, it's, it's moving very, very seamlessly. By the way, this is one of the points which I will talk about as we go along, which is going to make India an economic superpower, low cost tech solutions, low cost digital solutions. Now let's just look at what is happening in terms of, uh, you know, consumer behavior. What is very apparent is what is happening in terms of e-tail penetration. We are seeing more and more Indians going online and shopping, right? Uh, and of course, it's still very, very under penetrated. When you're comparing yourself to China on a like to like basis, you're still, uh, what? 10%, 20% of China's uh, e-tail population, e-tail penetration. But just look at how this has started changing the investment pattern, the retail investment pattern. A lot of people attribute the growth in the mutual fund segment to the mutual fund Sahi Hai campaign in terms of spreading awareness. I would also attribute to the fact that because everything is getting digital, the new age consumer is finding himself far more comfortable and convinced to invest in mutual funds online. As a proportion of uh, investments made, online has steadily increased as compared to offline. This is what digital payments, this is what digital transactions are starting to do. Uh, let's look at something more conventional. And I think a lot of businessmen here uh, would find this very, very interesting. The first thing is you look at the sort of credit growth, which is still left to conquer in this country. In the last 10 years, uh, you have found that overall credit to nominal GDP has gone up from 30% to almost 60%. There was a brief blip during COVID, but from 30% to 60%. This is something we understand. The offtake of credit is increasing. In fact, uh, I, I, I heard about a very uh, sort of insightful comment around 10 years ago when climate change was being discussed, when you know we're talking about, uh, we were talking about the possibility for drought coming into the country. And a very profound statement which came to me at that point of time is in India, agriculture, is no longer or rains are no longer the driver of the economy credit is okay? and that is exactly what has started happening we've grown through various cycles but just look at it from that point of view if we are going to be touching 100 percent in terms of overall credit to nominal gdp where is this money going to come in from so a lot of funding used to be done by nbfc's non-banking financial companies uh, which were raising money through different sources through different instruments like commercial paper and mutual funds were subscribing to those commercial papers. So mutual funds bought commercial papers floated by NBFCs. NBFCs in turn went and made sure that last mile credit, you know, you have those quintessential working capital requirements, personal loans, etc., being filled. Now, because of regulation and because of certain crises which have happened in the NBFC markets, this raising money by NBFCs through this avenue has become more challenging. Across Asia, 
this entire gap, which was early with banks and NBFCs, has now started getting taken up by AIFs. That's alternate investment funds, of which I will talk as we go along. In the mutual fund segment, which was a very potent source of uh, credit funding, the removal of indexation has now given more options to investors like yours, whether to go in for a mutual fund, whether to go in for an AI, whether to go in for a bond. And I think that itself has broad based the entire lending spectrum. So if there's PERMA change, there is also PERMA TAGA. And what is TAGA? There are good alternatives. Uh, this basically is a pun on the word alternatives. And you know, I'll, I'll share this with you in the next few slides, but a few data points before we begin. We need to understand ourselves as a country, as demographics, before we get into why alternates. Ultimately, this is what the whole masterclass is all about, right? Why alternates? But before that, the question is, why should you look at alternates? What does an average high net worth individual or family office ask for in an investment avenue? Well, the first thing is that the growth of wealth and wealth in this country is growing exponentially. Uh, you know, the rate of growth of wealth is compounding at such a fast rate that Indians have more money to invest. A lot gets talked about in terms of consumption patterns. India has crossed $2,000 per capita income. Hence, you may not be able to consume twice the amount of money or uh, twice the amount of food or three times the amount of clothes. But what people don't talk about is how investment habits are changing and how more and more Indians have started floating family offices, okay, or going to banks like yours to seek advice to grow their wealth. India is supposed to be having 250 unicorns in the next few years. Uh, Piyush Goel recently made a statement saying that uh, he would like to be the number, we would like to be the number one country in the next five years in terms of unicorns. There are 300 family offices in India today, up from 100 five years ago. So much so that the 25, it is expected that out of the hundred billion dollars which startups need to raise for their growth, 30% of them would come in from family offices. And if you just have to look at how fast they're growing, well, you can see the exponential growth which HNIs. HNIs here is defined, and this is this is basically RBI data, this is Cafe Mutual data, a lot of data points which we've collected. HNIs are defined as people who have assets of $1 million and above, and ultra HNIs are those who have more than $30 million and above. The number of HNIs is slated to increase dramatically over the next few years by almost 50%. And you're talking about, uh, you know, hundred, almost a 100% increase in terms of family offices and ultra HNIs over the next few years. So what do people like you and me want? Okay. We have access to the best advisors, we have access to the best information, but there are two tenets which remain constant throughout. We want to preserve our wealth and we want to grow our wealth. Okay. We are willing to basically look at trading liquidity for returns because we don't need the money. We are generating so much of money, but we want to make sure that all the hard work we've put in terms of creating wealth, make sure that wealth is preserved. So the three main things which HNIs asked for or ultra HNIs asked for in an investment avenue today, how can I create more alpha from where I'm creating, uh, uh, from where I'm already there? So if I've invested in a mutual fund or I've invested in a bond or I've invested in someplace else, what are the other sources of alpha that I can talk about? How can I diversify my portfolio? I have enough of real estate. I have enough of gold. I have enough of equity. I want to diversify my portfolio. Can I diversify geographically? Uh, can I hedge my portfolio? Can I have an absolute return strategy? And then, of course, capitalizing on emerging opportunity. Today's HNI and ultra HNI investor is completely tuned into the world. He is seeing what's happening in terms of crypto. He is seeing what's happening in terms of robotic ETFs, and he asks you, "Can you create something like this for me?" At the end of the day, what is an alternate investment fund? It is basically a group of not more than thousand investors who come in for a common objective. And these are the three top things which HNIs and ultra HNIs ask for. Create new sources of alpha, diversification, and capital as an emerging open. There are good alternatives. This is actually starting to happen. And this is what is available in the country at this point of time. You know, today, uh, if you want to participate in social causes, you want to fund social causes while making money, there's venture capital. If you want to help uh, VCs, shed their existing investments so that they can go ahead and uh, invest more. 
you have private equity firms. I just talked to you about private credit. Real estate has always been a single horse, uh, you know, race. We talk about physical properties, but there are so many different avenues to participate in uh, while talking about the growth of the real estate market in this country. Let's talk about long only. Long only is a con your, your conventional uh, portfolio, but here the savvy investor has a concentrated exposure to some exclusive sectors and stocks. Can you create a 20 stock portfolio which invests in electric vehicles for me if a bunch of HNIs and ultra HNIs ask? Yes, it can be done. And of course, hedging long short. Uh, this is very important in terms of creating an all weather portfolio and absolute return portfolio. If I have to just double click and show you each of these very, very quickly, uh, there are several strategies available. Almost all of them are available in India at this point of time. So you're talking about, for example, uh, let's talk about real estate. I just talked about real estate. You have distressed asset, you have special situations, you have affordable housing, you have commercial real estate, you've got warehousing. So you can see how sliced and diced the market has become. Uh, you talk about long short, long short for the uninitiated is in a portfolio where you can invest and disinvest simultaneously. I'm just making it sound very rudimentary. There's an absolute return strategy. There's a multi strategy. There's a market neutral strategy and you can create debt returns out of equity in terms of a strategy. So there are good alternatives. But is it restricted to India alone? Okay. Is this something we are seeing or is it a fad which has just come in? Uh, one needs to be very careful about a fad versus a trend. A fad is usually short term. A trend is very, very long term. Uh, I would draw solace from the fact as to what is happening globally because history has already unfolded itself to global opportunity. Now, this is 30 year data. This is 30 year data by Morgan Stanley. Okay. One of the key things it talks about is how you can not only reduce your volatility, but improve potential to generate more returns. So if you see uh, on the X axis, there is volatility on the Y axis, there is return. Over a 30 year time frame, if you would have had three portfolios which invested at one end 100% bonds to the other 100% stocks, and of course, a 50 50 bond and stock portfolio, and you would have added 20% alternatives to it, alternates, alternatives to it, which includes equity hedge, equity neutral, private equity, real estate, your overall returns would have gone up, minimizing the, uh, uh, and the volatility would have come down. This is 30 year data. This is global data. This is irrefutable. Data. Uh, and then again, what is it that makes alternates or has made alternates so, uh, so impactful in the global context? You see, one has to follow where smart money is moving. There was always money moving into actively managed funds when actively managed funds, uh, you know, uh, could not. I mean, when there was a lot of price exploration which happened and actively managed fund could not outperform the benchmark, people just reduced the cost and went into passives. Okay. When that itself started getting juiced out, they moved into alternates. So if you see this graph here, it's a very busy graph. If you could just look at the blue dots here, the blue circles here, it talks about two things. It talks about the growth on the Y axis in the last five years and on the X axis, how much money firms are making to bring these products to the investors. So it's a win-win situation. HNI is wanted, there are avenues available and now investment managers, some of the best talent has started moving globally and locally towards uh, alternates. Not surprisingly, the global alternative industry is expected to touch $25 trillion. Vikas sir. Yeah, please. Yeah, Vikas sir, uh, we're, we're getting a lot of queries from uh, the audience that the slides are stuck. Maybe can you unshare and then share it back again so that Sure, sure. What slide is stuck? If you can tell me, I'll go from there again. So I could see global alternative asset industry set to reach 24 trillion by 2028. Yeah. But a lot of uh, our viewers have faced problems. So maybe we can just refresh it. Okay. So very quickly, I talked about the alternative which are available in India. I double clicked on those alternatives and explained real estate and long short funds. And then I said that you already have precedence in terms of how globally people have invested. And this is a slide uh, I can tell you again is, is basically uh, how you can reduce volatility and increase returns. This is data which has come in from Morgan Stanley over a 30 year time frame. I will just check with my team uh, if the problem is at mine. Is there a problem at our end in terms of? 
uh, are the slides changing now? If you can just, uh, yeah. And then I talked about globally select alternates are expected to read, lead. I talked about, uh, you know, AUM growth as well as margin. Uh, these so, Vikas, uh, we're getting some mixed responses. Well, I can see, uh, you know, the, the, the last slide that you mentioned, some, are, some viewers are saying that they can see it well. Some are saying that it's stuck. Uh, you know, you mentioned that I'm on the uh, advisory board of India FinTech Forum. The irony <laughs> that internet is not something working. Something to pick, it up, something to pick up, yes. <laughs> it's not lost on me. Maybe this is something which a unicorn can get. So. Okay, so I'll just move to the next slide. I talked about the global alternative industry uh, set to reach $24 trillion by 2028. Is this slide visible? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, interesting for you to note that private credit and private equity are both slated to grow very uh, intensely. Private credit more than private equity. So the growth in private credit is really starting to climb now. Uh, so we talked about the global landscape. Now let's see what's happening in India. For the sake of this discussion, I have combined portfolio management services and AIFs as alternates. Uh, very loosely, alternates are basically something which is not mutual fund. Okay, so what mutual funds can't do, alternates can, is what is being talked about here. And this is the next slide which I'm showing. Uh, this talks about the growth in all three categories, uh, which is AIF CAT2, AIF CAT3, and PMS. So what is the difference between AIF CAT2, CAT3, and uh, and PMS, uh, AF CAT3 is equity. Uh, you know, you can leverage here. Uh, uh, it's usually listed equity, listed securities. CAT2 consists both of private equity and private credit, and PMS is only long only equity, no leverage allowed. So these are three different types of uh, uh, platforms. The minimum investment amount in PMS is 50 lakhs. And in CAT 2 and CAT 3 is 1 crore. Uh, and you know, you juxtapose it that with the mutual fund, that's 500 rupees, right? So you can understand that this is for somebody who understands this. So it's a very savvy audience. And how savvy is this audience? If you look at it, uh, just 10 years ago, less than 10 years ago, PMS as a segment, portfolio management services as a segment, was only 76,000 crore. This is discretionary, that is at the discretion of the fund manager. Today it's crossed 3 lakh crores. You talk about CAT 3, uh, from 6,200 crores, it's 1 lakh 28,000 crores. But the most dramatic growth has happened in CAT 2, okay, uh, which is from 32,000 crores odd to close to 9 lakh crores at this point of time. Because there's in a the question from the audience on this related yes. uh, slide. Uh, yeah. If you could give us a sense of uh, what's been the growth, uh, you know, relative growth when you compare real estate. Uh, related uh, alternates versus private equity and private credit. So is there a big divergence that you've seen in the last 10 years or what's the trend? So real estate growth has actually started picking up after 2018. Okay, there were some real estate uh, AIFs earlier uh, and there were a variety of strategies, but what moved the needle in the real estate segment has been RERA, has been GST. Okay, and of course COVID has been a reset. So if you see, uh, we run some real estate debt funds uh, most of the money which we're getting from investors has started actually coming in the last three or four years. Uh, private credit has been around, but private credit has also picked up in the last few years, seven or eight years, especially after the ILFS crisis. Okay, so this whole segment, a CAT 2 was earlier predominantly private equity. Private credit as a portion of it, you could talk about the last seven, eight years and real estate debt primarily in the last four or five years. I've answered your question. Yes. Thanks. What is equally important is that Indian alternates are expected to grow three times from here over the next five years. And not surprisingly, like I mentioned, it is supported by the growth of wealth in this country. The regulator is very open to letting this industry work in sandboxes, experiment, come up with new ideas, and of course, a thriving demand from people like your clients. On a, on a related note, uh, there was yeah. uh, some regulatory uh, restriction on uh, what the private credit could be extended to, whom the private uh, credit could be extended to the AIF, uh, you know, the, to avoid uh, greening of loans. Uh, you, maybe, you maybe want to spend 30 seconds on that. If Of course, okay. of course. So basically, uh, IBA came up with a circular recently and they've just clarified that even further. They've noticed that even further. 
so uh, what rbi found was instances so if i can just explain in a very very basic term uh, say i am the sponsor okay i have uh, a bunch of real estate investments which i have made i have lent to real estate companies let's say i have lent to 30 real estate companies okay uh, out of which i see around 20 of them getting wobbly i may not have made the right decision okay so these 20 companies if i have an af which is again housed with me can i just palm it off think it's a high yield security to these to this af so the investors will come in they will think that it's high yield but actually they are not as uh, kosher investments as what they ought to be the promoter is basically getting it out of their books not that there were any cases like that but rbi being rbi they were very very proactive about it and they said listen what you need to do is if you have an exposure to this company let's say company x okay or these 20 companies and you are farming of 10% of these 20 companies to the aif you have to make a provision for all companies okay you cannot say that i will uh, i will just go that it's a risk if the risk is the investors it has to be your risk and it cannot be to the extent of what you have given in the aif it has to be the extent of what you hold in your books so just to throw some numbers if i had a 500 crore book out of which 100 crores was wobbly okay and i gave 20 crores to my af okay uh, so please don't go by my choice of words i'm just trying to make it sound very very simple uh, i i have to make a provision for entire 100 crores and in an nbfc provision is a very very important thing because provision goes out of your core capital not out of your leverage capital so rbi has been very very clear about this not just that if for example i have another company which is not into real estate but which is into conventional personal loan funding okay and this company has actually funded the promoter's car let's say about 20 lakhs but the promoter has borrowed some money from me okay i still have to make a promotion provision for the entire amount whether the promoter is wobbly or not so if there is any sort of connection between any of the investee companies and me i have to make a complete provision for it okay now rbi has just come back and said to the extent of which the aif has you can make a provision you can tell but uh, not that it is too serious like i said because as an industry i think we've been very very proactive we've been very careful about it there are several uh, checks uh, and balances in the entire system uh, we ourselves i'm on the board of ivca i can tell you that uh, for each investment which comes in uh, we have a voluntary sort of uh, restriction on us we will have the investor called up talk to him saying that are you aware that this is the investment we are making in your money there are quarterly disclosures will happen which happen here these investors talk to our fund managers so i would think that rbi just uh, wanted to be on the safer side in a booming economy in a bull market the regulator tends to become very very cautious you would have already seen that with sebi this is exactly what happened have i answered your question yes uh The next slide basically talks about the growth, growing depth and breadth of alternates in India. This is already available from private equity to hedge funds to co-investments to special sets. It's already available. And if you just see the growth of this industry, this is just what a 10-year industry, 10-year-old industry, AIFs, and maybe a 15-year, 15 to 18-year-old industry in terms of PMS. Already, you will find that we have 174 billion dollars of assets, as compared to the mutual fund, which has been around for far longer. and as compared to domestic credit and equity market capitalization we are we are, we are growing very very fast this is probably you know uh, one of the final slides before i move on to uh, you know sort of giving you a market outlook this is proof of the pudding which is in the eating sort of a situation on one hand on the left hand side you are seeing the growing preference of investor allocation towards ais and this is a survey which has been done 5 years ago less than 5% of the people less than 5% of your clients me all of us would have had uh, i mean 91% of people had less than 5% of their allocation to aifs today uh 27% that's one out of four people already have an allocation towards aifs between 5 to 15% and that will increase to one out of two or even slightly more over the next 5 years because alternates are able to customize products for a bunch of investors giving them a diversification giving them wealth preservation giving them a variety of strategy so much so that if you look at people like us manufacturers people who actually create these products approximately 40% of us two out of five of us 
have already set a two year raising fund raising target of 1000 crores i think earlier if you touched 300 500 crores that used to be pretty uh, you know satisfying but i think 500 is just the starting point now that is the amount of interest which has started coming in terms of afs so just to summarize i talked about uh, uh, i talked about uh, a permanent state of change nothing remains permanent and i showed it across market geographies across market caps across macroeconomic variables across uh, debt and equity then i went to the fact that there is always a good alternative if everything changes then there are always good alternatives and i i showcased what alternate industry can offer over and above what is currently being talked about i also talked about uh, the core tenets of what hni investing is what do hni is want and what is the industry offering so this is pretty much what it is in terms of uh, uh, the aif industry i have a few slides on market outlook i can take it now i can take it when you are asking questions so over there maybe maybe we can so what what we can do is uh, there are a few questions on uh, the understanding so thank you for summarizing what we've discussed but if you yeah. could quickly uh, summarize uh, two things one what are the different types of aif vehicles like aif we talked about cat 1 cat 2 cat 3 so uh, uh, you know a quick summary of what cat 1 cat 2 cat 3 aifs are and what are uh, you know if we can also uh, position it so there are, since we have uh, within the audience we have investors who are hnis ultra hnis and also starting at the starting stage of the, uh, you know the inception of the journey of their investments how would you how would they find or access to these vehicles i mean with varying degrees of incomes and asset sizes how would they access these vehicles i think the first one is slightly easier than the second one uh, there are three AIFs, uh, CAT one, CAT two, CAT three, as we talk about, and I will tell you how I understand it. So, because as an investor, as a layman, and that's how people should get it. Uh, CAT one is basically something which is for a social cause. It's for venture capital. It's for building bridges. It's for the growth of the country. Anything which is a social cause. Usually, you have institutions, governments uh, participate and create such vehicles. CAT three is basically for listed securities. You can leverage there. okay uh, you can leverage as part of the product for example if i have 100 dollars in that particular product i can actually leverage within the product another 100 dollars and i can go long i can go short i can do a lot of things there cat 2 is something which is not cat 1 or cat 3 cat 2 thereby you see that's where the maximum growth has happened there there is a locking you cannot exit the fund unless or until the fund distributes money back to you uh, you cannot undertake leverage but the fun part about cat 2 is the sheer variety of uh, strategies which is available so that's the first part uh, uh, the second part is basically how can you access it well, it's fairly accessible i think uh, so i can just correlate it to the experience in mutual funds uh, 30 years ago these are products which are available but an aif is privately placed okay so while we might uh, you know uh, there would be a brochure you come across you can look at it but if you are not within the first 1000 investors and you're not coming out of your you know uh, own volition you will not be able to subscribe but for example if standard chartered is offering to its clients uh, this funds they can actually come in they can invest the key thing to note here is to find out whether it's suitable for you or not see uh, there is always going to be an issue when a lot of variety is being offered most people get overwhelmed by the sheer number of strategies which are available and most people tend to get carried away by the next shiny thing so if private equity has given a lot of money uh, has made a lot of money for you you know so most of the money will tend to go there suddenly in the media you will see funding winter coming in everybody start talking about funding winter the money will slow down you need to have a more consistent long term approach as an ultra hni you cannot be retail in your thing so if you make this distinction and you keep talking to your advisor this is a wonderful place to be a related question it's uh, on the chat box uh, what are some of the uh, the new products that have been launched in india in the alternate space uh, in the last 3 to 5 years and you know ultra hnis and hnis are warming up to those ideas or there is an increasing demand for some of the recently launched strategies if you could share some view on that so this is some part of the range which is available willy nilly in the country at this point of time Okay, so if I were to ask you a question, if I'm let's say uh, if my asset size is small, uh, like you know to qualify as an uh, HNI and ultra HNI, there is a threshold. But if I were to somehow you know I was on the threshold of an HNI, 
and I have a limited uh, understanding of this complex products. What would be some of the, you know, the uh, fitting strategies and how would it change if I had a larger asset size and more understanding of complex products? Is there, is there a way, is there a way you could position some of the, you know, complex strategies for investors? Yes, uh, but before I go there, I also want to share with you uh, once again, this slide, which talked about the, can you see this slide? Can everybody see this slide in terms of allocation to AFs? Yes. Okay. So what this means is that between five to 15% of your portfolio. Okay, so let's assume you want to invest five crores, your portfolio should be 100 crores. Uh, if you want to invest one crore, your portfolio should be large accordingly. It cannot be a disproportionate size of your portfolio. So that's the first thing. Okay, like I said, people cannot get lured away by the next shiny thing. You have to be very conscious of the fact that if you come into an avenue like this, you're sacrificing liquidity for returns. Okay, so that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is uh, where are people putting in money? I've seen uh, different people liking different sort of investment avenues. This is their asset allocation. This is their uh, risk appetite. Uh, but more often than not, there are three investment or three investment options which people are preferring. Private equity, of course, okay, that has been something which has taken off much earlier than anything else. And I think uh, it's also proved itself over a period of time in terms of return generation. Then private credit. I think over the last few years, uh, people are seeking out more and more debt as part of their asset allocation. They have become equity heavy, whether it's private equity or whether it's listed equity, uh, whether it's global equity. Uh, so I think private credit is something they're seeking out. It may not necessarily just be through AIS, they're seeking out across the board. AIS just happened to be a very convenient way to put in money. And the third one off late has been real estate. I think over the last three, four years in particular, see the whole attitude towards real estate has changed. Uh, you know, the whole thing about that, if I invest in real estate, they will go and invest in some property in the north, which will get stuck, or they will invest in a land bank, which has some political leanings and it will get stuck, has changed. Real estate is a micro market strategy. I can tell you about us, we focus only on the south. Okay. Uh, so there are people like us who take these deliberate strategies, go to where their strengths are, and they invest. So as a result of which real estate as a category has become more and more comfortable. So much so that a lot of ultra HNIs have actually come to people like us and said, listen, hey, you know, we like your real estate debt portfolio, but can we also co-invest where you are investing? So co-investing has also turned out to be a very strong proportion of the entire real estate debt. So just to encapsulate, make sure that it is not a substantial portion of your portfolio. And the three top things are uh, private equity, private credit, and real estate credit. So, a related question, and I think a lot of the uh, the Q&A uh, is focused towards that. One, uh, are REITs and INVITs also a part of the AIF, uh, you know, the, uh, the AIF uh, theme? And second, uh, is, it a, is, it, is there a possibility to invest in AIFs? And that's why my question on access became uh, important. Uh, is it possible to invest with less than one CR in AIFs? Both are good questions. So if you look at the asset management industry, you know, today if people talk about asset management, asset management is a word which is used fungibly with mutual funds. But there are actually four key pillars. Okay, mutual funds, portfolio management, AIFs, and REITs and invits. Okay, so that should probably, uh, so who can float REITs and invits? An entity which does not have a mutual fund can float. An entity which has a mutual fund can float. So it's a separate pillar altogether. Mutual fund, PMS, AFs, and REITs and invits. Uh, if you are an investor less than one crore, can you invest in AFs? As per regulation, no, you cannot. But SEBI has given you, uh, given the leeway to investors. See, why does, why does this insistence on one crore comes? The perception is that if you can invest one crore, you're savvy enough to understand what the risks are. Uh, as a regulator, I'm giving you all the leeways, uh, you know, to float an interesting product, cater to interesting demands, but the investor has to be savvy. That is why one crore. The other way to look at it is, SEBI has also said that if you are an accredited investor, there is a process for accreditation, you know, which talks about the fact that you've had a net worth beyond a point over a certain period of time, you understand the product, et cetera, et cetera. There, we can give you a relaxation. 
So for example, I can take 50 lakhs also from you in an AI, provided you're an accredited investor. There are checks and balances, there are do's and don'ts, but I can do that. But what is the proportion of accredited investors coming in as, as far as it's increasing? It's definitely increasing, uh, but it's not as much at this point of time. Uh, now, uh, you know, relating to one of the slides that we saw and uh, one of the uh, most talked about feature of alternative investments is that it lowers your portfolio risk and it was a part of your presentation. Yes. It not yes. only marginally improves the returns, but also lowers the risk. Of, that's a, a key feature. Uh, and the data which uh, normally gets floated across is very global. So in an Indian context over the last 10 years, and you know, this industry has now some history. Uh, have you seen uh, that uh, meaningfully play out uh, where addition of or a long short strategy or a long only or a private credit or private debt has actually lowered uh, over a longer period, lowered the portfolio volatility or improved risk adjusted returns? Yes and no. I think this is a relatively younger industry. Uh, and uh, it has gone through its own cycles. Like I said, real estate credit, for example, has made its presence felt since 2018, once the macroeconomic regulation changed. Okay, so you will have to give it some time. Uh, there will be slivers of data available for slivers of strategy. So you can have a long short strategy data available real estate for different periods of time. But at a consolidated level, if I were to create this sort of chart for India, at this point of time, it's not there. But I can tell you at an industry association level, we're collecting data. We are working on this and hopefully in the next six months, we should have some sort of uh, data to be shared with you. But at this point of time, no, it's not available. Yeah. So uh, now there are some questions on uh, risk mitigants within the alternative investment landscape, given that these are long vesting uh, investment, mostly if not all, and uh, quite complex to understand. So what are some of the checks and balances that you as an asset manager for alternative investments put in place? So the industry uh, practitioners do that. For MFs, it's very uh, you know articulate and very uh, transparent and laid out. But people are still to understand how the you know, alternate invest industry manages uh, in you know the, as a custodian of wealth uh, and trust. How do you go about managing risk? I can't tell you how much it gladdens my heart when you said the mutual fund industry is already doing it because we struggled with this 30 years ago, trying to tell people why is it better than an FD. Okay, at least you know we couldn't put it in writing, but we had to explain the virtues of it. Uh, and also so, thanks to the regulator, some very pioneering work being done there. Yeah, all the credit is given to the regulator. I'm just talking about for a change in the industry, right? I was on the Amphi board. I worked with the regulator. Uh, the ETF and indexing committee I worked on, I can tell you that the regulator took some brilliant strides after that. I'm just trying to pat the industry on its back. So it's a fully biased statement, full disclosure. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, what are the checks and balances, I think, first of all, as an advisor, you need to have certification. Okay? And you need to be certified both for PMS and AIF, there are separate certifications. And it's not easy to get through. Before I make my client understand, I have to understand it first. Okay? So this is the most important thing. Second thing is, SEBI is constantly looking at how this industry is evaluating, uh, is, is growing, is evolving. Okay, And it keeps coming up uh, see, they collect a lot of data. What is the difference between what used to happen earlier and what happens now is the regulator collects a lot of data. Okay, the regulator actually runs algorithms in terms of collecting data. So what I file with the regulator, they can go back last 10 years and see how, what my filing is. Okay, they can see whether I have, I have taken undue uh, advantage of interpretation and regulation and uh, given a little bit more distribution to my promoter entity than the investor. Have I discriminated? Okay, uh, they pick up anything, they will come up with the regulation and they'll make sure that uh, this is so that right now there can be no differentiation. There are different share classes, but there can be no differentiation. Everybody has to be offered the same product. Okay, it's like a old portfolio. Uh, that's the second thing. Third thing is that there's an elaborate documentation which happens. Okay, and there is also one, one pitch term sheet. What used to happen earlier is that in the elaborate documentation, people would have missed out on a few things. Right now, there's a term sheet which comes in, which is very clearly evident. The customer has to sign it himself. Okay. Last but not the least, I think uh, there are calls which are made by the manufacturer, by us, to the client explaining the whole product to them. Now, this is from an investor point of view. From a manufacturer point of view, what we do, we have several risk management strategies. Okay. Uh, please be aware that by uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So if you are allowed to do so many things, there have to be checks and balances. 
because at the end of the day the hni is coming to me for wealth preservation and growing their wealth he is not coming here to grow at any cost okay he is not coming here to tell me that you please give me 20% return year on year and i will take all the risk most people don't do that in fact nobody does that right so we have some serious checks and balances we have investment committee i can just tell you one thing before i close this point uh we have our own private credit funds okay two of the biggest things which make people comfortable when they come to us is one is that uh the promoting entity themselves will invest up to 20% of the overall aif there's serious skin in the game sebi insists 5% in terms of skin in the game right so that you don't uh, you don't uh, mess around with people's money but we go up to 20% and the second thing is companies like ours have investment committees of very senior financial professionals on our investment committee everybody from the promoter to you know mds of group companies they come and they sit it's extremely difficult to get a proposal through such a, a, a an eclectic bunch of people who will have their own set of questions checks and balances so this is how we mitigate the entire uh, sort of risk so so for the related questions uh, the next set of questions also related to this one uh, you mentioned uh, accreditation of investors you mentioned uh, long gestation for these investments you mentioned about liquidity if you could uh, so there are questions related to this so sure. what is the process of getting an investor accreditation can a self accreditation make work second uh, is uh, how liquid are the options so if there is a worst case scenario if there is a contingency to for investors to pull out are they really liquid or maybe it's a for feature clause and second is uh, how are the performances get indexed uh, there's a related question on the indexation but we can come to that later but if you could maybe you know string the query together so sure, sure, sure. so let me start from the uh, from the last question sebi prescribes benchmarks there are sebi benchmarks for pms there are three benchmarks for af there are set of benchmarks which have been created by krisil uh, we have moved from individual portfolio benchmarks so for example if i think i need a consumption benchmark sebi will say no this is what you can do so everybody is now on the same page you can evaluate our performances based on the benchmark a B is in terms of uh, liquidity of the portfolio, so we understand that there is an issue in terms of liquidity in the portfolio, and more, mostly people don't ask for it. But as a strategy, funds like us distribute money. There's quarterly distribution which happens. Okay. Now, for example, if I have to tell you, uh, we run a six-year fund. At this point of time, we have a six-year fund. Okay. Uh, uh, we would not invest beyond the fifth year, because one year we will keep just in case there is some dispute. You know, we don't want to extend the fund beyond. Now, even in this five years, the way we lend money to people, the money will keep coming back to us as coupon or capital payment back, so that I am able to give a distribution to my investors. Distribution is basically paying back the investors every quarter. So every quarter there would be payments which I would try and try to make to my investors, and they could be some very decent sums of money. Last but not the least, very recently, SEBI has insisted dematting of units of AIF. uh that itself has opened up a lot of avenues banks and nbfcs tend to fund you if your units are dematted okay so for example if your bank is keen to uh, do a product like this and if it's allowed in your uh, in your in your in your uh, memorandum and articles you can actually lend against aif units most people don't even exercise that option they just want to be comfortable they say in case i need the money because at the back of people's mind is what played out in 2008 in fmps you know when they needed the money that money was not available and that's a very valid sort of uh, concern so these are the things in terms of accreditation i can help you there's a there are sebi is promoting it quite a bit there are uh, there are players who can do that they can get it accredited we can also get help you get accredited uh, so that's a process you you need to talk to a chartered accountant and get your net worth certificate it's it's become much simpler now it used to be very complex earlier and it is getting simpler I think uh, we are moving to a time and place wherein your accreditation can be done in three working days. Great. So, so we've covered uh, indexing. Some we covered liquidity. We covered accreditation. Uh, now there are a couple of questions on uh, the expanding uh, uh, universe of uh, alternate investments uh, like private markets. Uh, are digital currencies, gold, digital gold, digital rupee? nfts all are becoming a part of the alternate investment uh, landscape or um, and what according to you could be the next uh, you know new new investment avenues for alternative nice 
it's already part of it globally. Uh, art, crypto, all of this is part of alternates globally. Now you will find one fund or the other. By the way, in India, there are some 700 strategies in AIFs and there are some 500 strategies in PM. Okay, uh, most of it are pretty conventional. Uh, they follow they follow a trend, but it's not too long. Uh, it's not too far off that somebody will think of a strategy here. In the local markets, there is restriction. Okay, uh, you know, SEBI, SEBI, IBI, they're just going a little bit more careful in terms of what products they allow, for example, on the crypto part, on the digital currency part. But it's a question of getting used to things. I think it's not too far off when you will start seeing inverse ETFs, you will start seeing a lot of uh, crypto denominated products. My sense is that it might come up in gift city first. It might not happen in the local markets first because there I think uh, the segment of investors is slightly different. They're more global in their perspective. Uh, when will it happen? My sense is in the next three years, you will start seeing a variety of differentiated products coming into. Market. Sure. So now we'll tell, since we are towards the end of the session, what we'll do is we'll take two questions and then uh, maybe a brief market outlook as well. So the question that uh, I think you know, which uh, is getting repeated is one on the uh, alternate investment side as well. Uh, is it running growth or value strategy? I think that's a question. <laughs> yeah. I think very loosely. Uh, you know, you also did a, a, a research, a very detailed research uh, recently about value and quality and value and growth. Uh, maybe. Maybe a, a 30, 60 second wrap up on that would also maybe answer the question. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, question and we got some insights in terms of this white paper we released. I can share it with you. You can share it with your clients. I think the media has also picked it up. Uh, so what is growth and what is value? Uh, what is quality and what is value? Uh, it's very easy. So first of all, there is something called active management and there's something called passive management. Active is managing the portfolio actively, trying to beat the benchmark. Passive is following the benchmark. These are two extreme ends of the situation. Now, between active and passive, there are some factors which come in, which will improve the returns, okay, or ostensibly improve the returns. These factors can be momentum, wherein you follow the trend. These factors could be size, you know, where you invest a lot of money in one particular stock. Two such factors, one is quality and one is value. Quality, as the word suggests, has some very set parameters. You have to have uh, the quality index, for example, there's a quality index at this point of time. The companies which you invest in have to have a 30% uh, ROE, sorry, 20% ROE, uh, three year track record of profitability, and uh, one, is to, uh, one is to two maximum in terms of leveraging. Okay. As is the, uh, what is suggested by this, the company seems to be in a more established sort of format. There is a process, there is, uh, it's proven a track record, there's good governance, promoters have, uh, have established the credibility. Value on the other hand is taking a bet on a particular concept. It could be the promoter, it could be the industry. Conventionally value has always been picking up beaten down stocks, stocks which are out of favor. But it could also mean taking a, a bet on something which you think might do very well in future. Like, you know, one of our esteemed industry colleagues took a bet on PSU banks for 10 years before it actually flared up in the last two years. To stay the course for 10 years was a value strategy. Now, PSU banks themselves have evolved. Okay, so they may not necessarily be value picks. So that's the basic difference between growth and value, uh, quality and value. But very important point to note here is, what would you do in your own life is the answer to this question. Would you go in for something which is a quality good and pay a premium for it? Or would you go in for something which is untested, unbranded, but you see that over a period of time, it will shake the foundations of quality. Okay. As an investor, I find it very comfortable to go with something which is branded quality. I don't mind paying a slightly premium thing. Over there, a sasti cheese or achi cheese may fark hota as the ad goes, right? And quality is a uh, is a premium thing. Uh, the most important thing about quality is when the markets crack. Okay, quality does not fall as much. So the returns which come in through quality are better risk adjusted. I don't know whether I was too technical, but I thought I should just give this uh, thing. Uh, typically, after a global crisis, for the first two to two and a half years, value does very well because there's a gush of money which comes into the system. But after that, till the next global crisis, quality does very well for the next five years. So you'll have polarization of stocks, five or six stocks driving the nifty, high quality companies coming in. And quality actually works much better in the, uh, in the mid cap segment. In the large cap segment, one can argue that it's 50-50 quality and value working together. What was the second question? I missed that. You said the first question was growth and value. Yeah. The second question that I wanted to pick up is 
now that we have a fair understanding of what alternatives are how do we allocate it in the in a foreign investor for example if there are three investors uh, one he's a 25 year old uh, employee who's just begun his career and has a an, uh, salary income what should his portfolio allocation be like across asset classes versus somebody who's like in his uh, mid of his career he's made some progress he has an asset maybe qualifies as an hni and somebody who is uh, towards the end of retirement maybe 75 plus has a very strong asset size but not maybe not uh, a very long uh, you know uh, period of investments available because he's maybe at 75 80 years of age so how would the allocation be i can tell you from what i'm seeing out there uh, these are data points which you glean uh, first of all i've not seen a 25 year old guy you know who's starting off his career investor crore uh, but i'm assuming that he's coming from a fairly affluent background which is where he can invest he understands risk otherwise i would have immediately told him mutual funds more than anything but assuming he has the capability he has the bandwidth uh, he would tend to go more towards private equity i think uh, typically these would be younger guys who build businesses sold off their businesses and they want to reinvest uh, in their own fraternity to grow okay so private equity will be will be more uh, important to them uh, middle stage i think people going for private credit Okay, because that's a question of where you know you have uh, you have liquidity requirements at times you know uh, you are building a business you are investing uh, in some acquisition which you are doing you need liquidity as well so liquidity takes a bit of a, uh, uh, a precedence which is why the tendency will be to be a little bit towards debt or stable instruments and in that private credit forms a part now here's the fun part for guys who are 60 70 80 okay they have a lot of surplus okay? and that is the segment uh, which which not 60 70 80 but let's say 45 50 which tends to explore a lot lot more because even if they invest 10 crores or 15 crores per strategy typically that's not a very sizable portion of their overall thing you know if he would have already made a trust for his children for his grandchildren he would have already sold some business off to a foreign partner he wants to enjoy life uh, so typically i think that is a sort of person who will experiment with a lot of strategies you might find a disproportionate amount in private equity and listed equity and you wouldn't have thought that a 65 year old guy can do that but if he's running a family office he understands exactly what he's getting into and uh, that's what he will do thanks because so we are at uh, 5 10 now uh we the webinar stops at 5 15 so maybe in the next few minutes two three minutes if you could summarize the uh, market outlook uh, for our uh, viewers uh, that would be okay. nice before we close so i'm not going to run any slides now i had three or four slides i'm not going to run that in the interest of time so two parts to the market outlook one is the short to medium term and one is the long term uh, i think short to medium term uh, it looks fairly uh, evident that we are going to see a little bit of froth coming back into the market and thereby a lot more volatility my problem is not the fact that you could have a stable government at the center my problem is that too many expectations have been built in. so you know even if there's a slight deviation a few seats here and there the markets are looking for an excuse to correct that is in the short to medium term okay so markets have raced ahead of the economy uh, a few years ago the economy was doing very well markets were not now markets are building in a lot of froth so one has to be just a little bit mindful whereby again you shift more towards quality than value if at all the market corrects you would rather sit in a quality stock rather than sitting in a stock which can go down by 70 uh, percent the second part is more interesting i think to just take you away from that noise if i have to just tell you uh, See, there are three points. One is two thousand dollars per capita income. Once you cross, a country generally tends to become prosperous, and India will become prosperous. But the argument we have here is that if you have to become an economic superpower, what is your advantage? In the fifties, the U.S. actually had uh, the American dream as their advantage. You know, they were just coming out of World War II. Uh, they were relatively unscathed, so they projected through Hollywood and all other types of communication. You know, happy environment, happy families. Uh, they attracted a lot of immigrant population, attracted a lot of capital. So they built in manufacturing, they built in consumption, they built in banking, and thereby consumption. In 2006, and they became a superpower by the way. 1970, uh, you know, they became the fiat currency of the world. Uh, nine, uh, if you talk about 2006, China crossed $2,000 per capita income. Okay, and their value proposition to the world was, we will become the manufacturing hub for you. We'll give you American scale at Japanese manufacturing practice. Okay? And the world bought into it. 
So from two thousand dollars, currently uh, China's per capita is around sixteen thousand dollars, and all in a span since two thousand six. We are talking about fifteen to eighteen years that this is. Now you look at what is happening in India. India, I think the markers. If you just look, uh, by the way, in China, what grew was banking. And financial services. What grew was consumption. What grew was manufacturing, and what was a revelation to the world was digital. They just kept data within the country and built on it, built business models around it. If you look at India, I think our proposition to the world, which the world has now accepted, is low-cost tech solutions, low-cost digital solutions. Okay, from you know handling COVID to UPI to Jan Dhan, more and more countries from frontier markets, emerging markets, developed markets are looking at us. The fact that we have a strong leadership is obviously there, but I'm saying if you have to look at it in a very neutral way, this is a value proposition to the world. And if indeed this is the value proposition to the world, the next 15 years are going to be ginormous. You know, and which are the sectors which are expected to do well? Uh, again, going by history, banking and financial services, manufacturing, consumption, and digital. So, and of course, I will add one more now, which is the need of the hour, which is carbon neutrality. So you do just zoom out, look at what is happening, stay the course for 15 years, try to get into quality stocks. The amount of money which can be made in the next 15 years can be generation changing. So that's what I thought I should just end with. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Vikas sir, for taking the time out and explaining uh, the, the very complex investment options to us in so much detail uh, with a lot of patience. Uh, We'll close the session with a short video on our SC Invest capability. Want to invest, but still figuring out how to start, where to invest, or whose guidance to follow? How about an investment tool that brings together industry-leading solutions in one place? Presenting Standard Chartered Invest, your one-stop online investment shop. What does it do for you? Well, for starters, there's no paperwork to open an investment account. And if you're confused about where to start investing, just tap to view our pre-generated SIP packs based on your risk appetite. Not just that, you can get theme-based fund ideas too as per your investment needs. With comprehensive market insights at your fingertips, now you can easily keep track of the markets and get access to detailed reports. So that you can make informed investment decisions, monitor the performance of your investments and realign them as per your convenience. And no matter where you are, transact on the go while having complete control of your investments in your hands. View all your holdings, buy new funds and do a lot more with your SIPs too. You can pause or cancel your SIPs whenever you want or resume as well as redeem them anytime as per your wish. All this and a host of other benefits just waiting for you to explore on SC Invest. Get set invest today. Simply log into online banking or the SC mobile app. Download now.